I'm here in the Getty Institute in Los Angeles talking to Vanessa Swartz, a historian and art historian at the University of Southern California. And my first question, Vanessa, is what was modernism? Well, of course, many people will begin to answer that question by uh, talking about painting and literature. And they'll talk about new ways of thinking about time, new ways of thinking about space, and questions of realism and figuration. But my approach has always been to this question of modernism to frame modernism in the broader context of the history of modernity. And for me, modernity is about uh, another set of transformations that are economic, that are broadly social, about the democratization of culture, that are also about the ability to see your own world represented and represented. So this Heidegger talked about the era of the world picture. And for me, one of the most powerful things about modernity is the distancing of the world as an experience so that people actually started to imagine their world as if it were a representation. So things that I like to talk about when I talk about modernity are things like wax museums, which are new in the 19th century. Uh, I like to talk about the history of photography, panoramas and dioramas, which were very realistic uh, kind of entertainments, which uh, in a sense are the precursors to a lot of the Disneyland rides that we see today in theme parks, both at Disneyland but elsewhere, where again, real life experience is simulated. And to me, the kind of natural height of this experience of modernity and the taste for reality as a representation is the development of film in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. And of course, most people, when they think of modernism, are not really looking for realistic narratives like the movies. They're thinking about Duchamp. They're thinking about Picasso. They're thinking about Impressionist painting. But what I think is really important is also to see the corollary in entertainment culture, in commercial culture. So I think modernity includes the history of things like posters and new forms of technology, like the four color poster. The great master of the poster is a French guy named Jude Chéret, who did amazing artwork that was also a form of advertising. So I think what you also see in modernity is the commercial aesthetic which I think is something that we don't really have too much of before modernity, but that I think what characterizes modernity, rather than think of the avant-garde, is actually to think of the mainstream commercial culture. It's interesting that you, you talk about the important role of commercialism, uh, of, of commercial culture and of mass culture. Um, what do you think uh, of the schism that happens about mid-century with someone like Greenberg who then of course writes uh, avant-garde and kitsch where this is then placed as a kind of a lower form of bastardized culture. Well and this uh, differentiation between avant-garde and kitsch I would argue in the intellectual world has been a means for art history to have a disciplinary identity to be something other than history because if you don't have a notion that art is something and then there's everything else which is what we could think of as visual culture then really we don't have a kind of history of art and my own inclination is to say that there is something called a history of art but it is a subset of the broader history of visual culture and in that way I would totally reject obviously people like Greenberg as simply elitist dinosaurs desperate to legitimate the study of this thing called art and to kind of recapitulate the categories of taste, etc., mm. that art history has uh, until recently been all about. And instead, I think there are artists and I think they live in a world that they call the art world at the time that they live. So it's not to say there's no such thing as art. I think there is. But uh, in Germany, there's been a kind of um, way of framing this as uh, Bild Wissenschaft a kind of history of images and image making. Mm. And in a way, that's really kind of been more my orientation, except that I would say that we can't stop at the two-dimensional image. We need to have architecture in that. We need uh, consumer products and their design to be part of what we think of as a history of art. So I really totally reject the idea that there is something called kitsch. 
you know, one person's kitsch is another person's art. Mm. Now, I don't think that we could reject the idea that people identified kitsch, and so we can study and try to understand what did Clement Greenberg think kitsch was. But I think the idea of seeing what Clement Greenberg thought was kitsch was not to decide whether this really is kitsch, but rather to say that in defining certain things as kitsch, we see a whole history of taste. And it's very clear to me that the history of art has been bound up since modernity in the history of taste. And that the avant-garde, ironically, seems to reject, of course, supposedly elitism and mainstream values, but we really see the way in which they simply are in a kind of a mirror uh, image of the mainstream elite, but they are another form of elite. And the avant-garde has always been a form of, uh, of elite culture, which I think sometimes is very insightful and provides critiques of the other elite culture, but what it never seems to get at is popular taste. And it never seems to have any understanding or be able to shed any sort of light on popular taste. And so when people talk about post-modernity, that's supposed to be artists that are more tuned in to popular culture, but really they are simply, I would argue, reappropriating it, again, for elite uh, reasons often I find them droll and ironic and I actually don't think that irony is the most interesting form of commentary which I think is one of the great problems of contemporary art in general mm -hmm. that it functions as a form of irony and what that takes away is some of the things that art actually used to do for people which is give them pleasure give them you know comfort uh, move them deal with sensory experience and so so much Postmodern art, especially the conceptual stuff, to me is uh, very uh, uninteresting. And I much prefer, uh, frankly, what I would call, and on my own taste, uh, which is very unusual for an academic to say, falls much more in the general uh, categories of what we would call modern mass culture. And mm -hmm. I find that that can be pleasurable, that can be meaningful, and that can also provide great insights into our own world. And it doesn't simply replicate all the values of our world just because a lot of people like it. And I think that's one of the missing uh, uh, understandings of modern uh, culture is that intellectuals tend to think that if it's popular, it must be bad. Yeah. yeah. And I think people aren't so stupid. No. And I think we need to actually have more appreciation for what it is that people, that really moves people in the world we live in. And that's what I've always been much more interested in. So Disneyland, Las Vegas, I work on the, I wrote a book on the 19th century versions of that yeah. in Paris, but I've been interested in that in our own world too, and not to simply denigrate it, but to think about, well, what is so effective? What, what, you know, what are they really communicating to people that people in the millions come here and experience? They're not simply uh, automatons. They are mm. actually engaged in this form of culture, and we need to understand it. Do you think there's a kind of a uh, sort of a hierarchical um, snobbery, really, around anything to do with the, the, the sensory and particularly the emotional uh, within within culture generally? Well, absolutely. So one of the really interesting things, the the work I'm doing here at the Getty right now, is actually about the history of color news pictures, mm. uh, color photojournalism, and one of the kind of odd things is that most people act as if there were no photos, news photos that are in color. But of course there were lots of news photos that were in color from the beginning of color photography from autochromes in 1907. There have been published press images of the news in color. But we don't like to think about color pictures because color pictures are seen as kind of too emotional, uh, too much for kind of children. Women and children like color. And we have to denigrate color because it's seen as kind of too much a part of uh, popular culture and not, again, sophisticated and uh, restrained. And so I think that there's no question that the culture that is sensory or that borders on the idea of being entertainment mm. then is somehow not serious. And instead, I think the history of fireworks, for example, is totally important and interesting, runs across a lot of cultures from Asian cultures to European cultures, and I have a student, uh, Laura Calbo, who actually wrote a dissertation that deals with fireworks, with also color in flower uh, 
flowers, both the hybridization of flowers through making new colors, and also how you plant flowers to make some kind of colorful sense. So I think color is a totally important uh, category of um, uh, aesthetic experience, but one that is denigrated precisely because it is emotional. Yeah, yeah. Lost that. Now, one of the things I was really interested to to ask you about um, when I teach my course to first years on uh, modernity um, and modernism being the expression of modernity one of my favorite images to talk about is Gustav Kaibot's Paris Street Rainy Day uh, and another historian another art historian who has uh, written about this Charles Stuckey says that he talks about um, there is what he said is a typically French face-off that happens in that image. Do you know the part that I'm talking about with the couple walking towards and there is another figure that you can just see the back of. Um, you've actually written a lot about um, French culture. Uh, what, would, what are your thoughts about that idea of this face-off? Well, if by that you mean a kind of cross-class yeah. uh, experience, I mean, I think that that painting in general, of course, is a comment on the transformation of Paris in the mid-19th century, its rationalization. I mean, I think that it's a painting, its grayness uh, itself is meant to be about a certain form of urban monotony, actually. But what breaks up the monotony are not only the umbrellas, um, which bring you down to everyday life and the experience of things like rain, but also the people that you see, the woman, the man, the working class uh, man, and the exchange of urban life as a kind of a crucible of cross-class experience. And one of the things, of course, that so much Impressionist painting is about is looking and being a part of a modern urban crowd. And people have talked about the flaneur, and many people have talked about the gendering of the flaneur, that you know this is a form of male, gazing, but what I've always thought is that actually this emphasis on a culture of looking and seeing really suggests that everybody has the ability to be kind of part of the story and part of the looking. And so instead, though the person who looks is in a sense empowered, but I don't think that this culture actually limits that looking to privileged men. Quite the opposite. I think that what we understand is that especially when you've got city life or you've got entertainment culture, you really have a crowd that is cross-class and also uh, of both genders. And you'll see, I wrote in the 19th century about a very strange phenomenon, which were public visits to the Paris morgue, which was uh, had a big, huge plate glass window. And you know, 20, 30,000 people in a day would walk through the morgue and look at the dead bodies that were exposed behind plate glass window. And in all the representations of the morgue, which by the way, people used to refer to as the free theater of the city, in all the representations, you had women, you had children, you had maids, you had dogs. Now, people have asked me, well, do you really think dogs were there? And I actually think there probably were dogs, and anybody who knows Paris knows that there are dogs everywhere in Paris. <laughs> but really what the dog means is that this is le tout Paris, this is all of Paris, this is not just the elite, that these dogs or these children are there to kind of stand in for the fact that city life is a spectacle for everybody and not simply a kind of replaying of elite culture. So I think those that kind of art also, and Caibot was very aware of putting different classes in his paintings. The Pont de l'Europe uh, also exactly one, yeah. is very much about, um, I would say, a cross-class experience. And again, whenever... The dog is in that. And the dog is in that, <laughs> exactly. And I think when people see class, they immediately see then um, inequality. But mm. I think one of the interesting things about the 19th century was that class also, for the first time, meant actually all of society being mm. in the same place which is already a kind of major shift from a kind of pre-modern uh, you know, idea of a society which wasn't so much class-based as status-based mm. and where you know, people of different statuses would never occupy yeah. the same yeah. place or you know, be thought uh, 
to uh, appreciate the same form of culture. That was kind of unheard of. And I think what's really interesting in the 19th century is it really shakes up these ideas and right. people really, I'm not saying that there's great equality be between classes, but I think that there is a shared culture for the first time, which is what mass society uh, is all about. And that's kind of new. And yeah. I think Kaibot had his finger on that in many ways. It's um, it, it's kind of reflected also in someone like Emile Durkheim who talks mm -hmm. about you know the way that society, you know the functionalist idea of society um, arises at that particular kind of time as well, isn't it? It's this idea. Um, there's uh, I think it's Ford Maddox Brown that work called Work, which is in Manchester, um, is this very idealised image of. It's even painted in a kind of a vignette that's pyramid in shape with the upper classes at the top and the middle classes and the navvies kind of you know then down at the bottom um, and it's very much that uh, the idea of a society working almost like a machine in now Durkheim though of course was very yeah. stressed about all these changes in modern mm. life and he wrote his great book uh, Suicide mm. using in fact statistics from the Paris morgue ah. um, he believed that there was more suicide in modern life mm. um, which no one has actually proven to be true, but why Durkheim was interested in suicide is because he thought that people were essentially alone in these crowds, mm. that essentially that these were forms of alienation, and that while there was a mass society, people nevertheless were so disconnected that essentially they killed themselves. Mm. And so he talked about it and developed the social theory called anomie, mm. which is essentially one of the great modern problems, being in a crowd and being alone. Um, I would disagree with that, and I think that, you know, the way to understand that best is to say, you know, if you look at France, for example, there's a lot of revolutionary activity in France over the course of the 19th century. And then after the Paris Commune, basically there are no more revolutions. Some people have said, well, why? And they say, because the forces of repression became so much more effective and efficient. And that's one way to think about it. But another way to think about it is that actually people did start to participate more mm. in cultural life and had kind of greater belonging and greater satisfaction. So I think rather than see the social as a kind of glass half empty, which is the kind of Durkheimian way of looking at this mass society, mm. I've kind of been much more interested in seeing the glass as half full. And I think people, even Marxists like Walter Benjamin, for example, had their finger on the idea that not all of this culture was alienating mm. and that there was really something in it and of course I think for Benjamin film was the form that would unleash the kind of democratic nature of, it was a kind of um, the, a visual form of the democratic transformations of society in the late 19th and early 20th century and I think there is something to be said about that so that's kind of where my interests and orientations tend to lie. Mm. Now I did want to ask you about. Uh, I have a. Uh, I, I teach a, a course on writing and art theory, and um, I find it very interesting to to talk to people who also deal with uh, writing in this field and um, try to kind of gain their thoughts about the process of writing and how how do you go ahead teaching that process to students. What are your thoughts about that? Well, one of, I think, the most, there, there are two different kinds of writing that I teach. And I think the one that is fairly unpredictable, but is the writing of the future, has to do with writing in images. And this is what Benjamin was very obsessed with, the idea that the book would be kind of like the catalog and that all we would do is cite. And for Benjamin, I think he was thinking of those citations as a set of images. And so with PowerPoint, with Keynote, with Prezi, actually what I teach my students and almost all of my students now have to do is write visual essays. Mm. And they have well, to make multimedia yeah. um, uh, visual lessons is what I say. Yeah. So they always write papers that are not simply in images because I don't think that the image alone is sufficient, yeah. but they make essentially five minute films, all of them now, uh, as one of the activities that they do uh, in our classes yeah. so that they can try to understand how juxtaposing images mm. is a form of criticism and analysis and how you can tell a story. I would say that what I do that makes this and what I teach that makes this mm. not like art is that I have told them their goal is not to express through the image but to analyze and to argue mm. through the image. And they do this with words as well, and they mm. do this by 
putting images, you know, potentially in relationship to each other, and then putting arrows or doing things to draw our attention to certain elements of the images. So it's not without deliberate uh, direction, which I think is the kind of danger of using multimedia as a form of writing, because what we do is, as I said, we do not uh, simply express, we also form critical and analytical arguments. Those are done in images, and those are also done in words. So I think one of the great challenges when you are teaching about visual culture is to use a form of representation, abstract representation, which is the written word, mm. is this form of language to translate mm. the experience and the observation which you use with your eyes and with your ears, we can say in multimedia uh, art and in film, and you need to translate that through the written word. So you need to have of course, ekphrasis, as we all call it in art history, which is the power of description. Mm. You need to understand how to translate experience and observation into something that's more abstract, which is what the written word is. Mm. And so you need to have a rich uh, vocabulary of the written word in order to make those translations. And this is what I say to my students, like you actually need to know a lot of words because those words come in handy when you are trying to translate experience into words. And then of course you actually need to have the command of grammar and all the kind of old fashioned things uh, in order to make the description meaningful. And remarkably, what's great about the written word is that it actually does have the power to be understood across time and space in a really extraordinary way. And then there are tra then then you can be translated from French to English or whatever, then into another language in which that kind of interchangeability exists. And I think why ri the written word is a higher form of communication is precisely because it requires a precision mm. that I think students need help uh, uh, working on, and that you know they are uh, that there is a tendency to let the image or the experience speak for itself. And when you do the multimedia uh, uh, presentations, I think they lean back on the image itself mm. as kind of representing its own story. And so they are less involved. And that's why I'm very insistent that the multimedia projects be equally didactic yeah. um, as the written projects. But I think writing about images essentially means a form of translation and I will say that one reason I've turned to the multimedia projects is because I think sometimes words not only are they harder mm. but they also are in some ways insufficient mm. because I think one of the great things about new technology is that we can be didactic and represent at the same time mm. and kind of reconstruct an experience a kind of artistic experience and that that's something that is in and of itself a valuable valuable activity to kind of represent the object and to situate it and to describe it and to give it a kind of contextualization which can be oral which can mm. be written uh, but I think that what's wonderful about working in the field of the history of art and visual culture is that objects are not eloquent in themselves but their presence is very powerful in promoting reflection and criticism and analysis, which is what we do as scholars. So mm. it's a, it's a, they're wonderful companions, and they also need our help to make them really, I think, have meaning, and different people make them mean differently, which is why art and visual culture can be endlessly interpreted and reinterpreted, which is one of the great things about teaching it. Mm. Those, those projects sound like they demand, uh, I, th I think it sounds brilliant. I mean, I'm always uh, interested in trying out new things, new approaches of, uh, of teaching, and that sounds really fantastic. I've never, never thought of that, that's just fantastic. Because it, it demands a certain level of, um, of literacy mm -hmm. in the image. And this is one of the things that I've been really trying to, uh, in the five years that I've been at the University of Newcastle, I've been trying to sort of shift it away from a kind of a rote learning, uh, data collection approach to a, right. an assignment, which let's face it, anyone can Google anything and rip it off Wikipedia. Exactly. Um, more to, uh, uh, one of the things that I use in the first year course is um, is Uwen Panofsky's 1939, you know, tried and tested, but it's, you know, fantastic tool to get them to start learning and thinking about analyzing what is then then thinking about in the broader context. 
Um, so I think you know what you're suggesting uh, with something combined with the sort of a tool which allows them to construct knowledge um, about the image rather than just kind of retrieve it. I think it's really interesting. Yeah. Well, and yeah. I, will, I mean, I will say that I think the the key, and mm. and this is what you've already put your finger on, which is you have to have some idea mm. about how to look at an image mm. and what you're looking for yeah. before the students can do it themselves. Yeah. But what I would also say, and one thing I start with sometimes, is their own images mm. that they choose and that they explain before they're told how to read them. Because right. what's amazing about young people today is that their ability to mm. look at an image mm. is actually pretty good compared, mm. say, to their ability to read 20 pages of written text. Yeah. We, we often need to teach them to read words more. Yeah. They don't know how to read for the point in a paragraph. Mm. They know mm. how to look at an image. They know the complexity of images. They mm. know they're not so self-evident yeah. because they are saturated in that kind of looking. And so I would say that they're mm. natural lookers. And the question for me has always been to take their natural skills and talents of looking at images and then step back and make them make sense of it as a critical process. Mm. Because I would say for most of them, it's intuitive. So what I think we do when we teach the history of visual culture or art is to reassess um, mm. uh, their own knowledge base by stepping back mm. and saying, well, how do you know what's going on in this image? Yeah. And then making it more orderly because yeah. then they become more self-aware. Mm. And um, most of them, not all of them have good eyes, mm. but they would say, I would say on average, they have better eyes than people, than their parents do because they are already trained even though they don't know it yeah and so now we need to tell them well what do you know yeah because they only do it and the great thing about education is what we do and why it's higher yeah. education is because we give them a level of self-awareness mm. and critical distance yeah that is what separates being and doing mm. from knowing mm. And knowing is also a form of distance. Mm. Uh, you know, Kant, for Kant, that's what aesthetics was all mm. about. And I think we can't lose that. And I think there's a lot of pressure today. Uh, there's a lot of privileging of experience. There's a lot of privileging of the doers. You know, we're in a world uh, controlled by engineers, uh, mm. all of whom believe knowledge is problem solving, mm. you know. And I really think that we need mm. to stand back and say, well, and I think also in your field, in, in art history, especially in contemporary art, mm. there's a lot of privileging of contemporary artists. You're talking to artists, mm. you know? Um, and the idea that we need to talk to artists and that they have anything to say to me is, you know, you could argue a fairly dubious um, uh, issue because they are makers. Yeah. They make things. Let them make their things. I don't really, you know, my thing is they make, we analyze. So I also think for students, yeah who aren't art students. Uh, I mean, there are art students and they make. Mm. But I think we also need to think harder about the value of distance and the value mm. of knowing uh, that distance uh, allows. And so that we're not all just trying to be artists and not mm. all artists are trying to be intellectuals. Yeah. I think, you know, there's some differences. Oh yeah, absolutely. They and also, I think, I think, are good, productive differences. In the, in the last 20 years, there's, uh, I think that there has been uh, a very productive split <laughs> that's happened from you know the, the late 80s when we went through that you know artist as intellectual and you know uh, everyone was trying to write like Baudrillard right you know, <laughs> right <laughs> which um. I'm glad is <laughs> is over and um, one of the things that I talked uh, to to Douglas Vogel about um, in that regard was that uh, I've noticed that uh, mainly in the mainly in the sort of art press rather than necessarily you know, journals, but uh, I'm talking about art magazines, there seems to have been a, a shortening of, uh, of feature articles and reviews. Reviews seem to be very, very short these mm -hmm. days. Well, I think all, I mean, the art press itself, I think, is an interesting uh, world because not only are reviews getting shorter, so everything that's in print is some version now of what you'd find on the internet. Mm. So it is kind of the internet writing has kind of infected 
or bled into print culture. I think that's definitely the case. But I would also say that there's also a telescoping of temporality, so that what is most remarkable to me is the way in which nobody is interested in anything that happened before 1970. Mm. And that is very shocking to me because I don't really understand how people, even who want to make art mm. today, uh, would not think that the road into that is the centuries of other art making. Mm. I just, you know, that's always been what artists did. Mm. They didn't just look outside their window, they looked outside their window but stood on the shoulders of giants uh, and maybe some not giants. Maybe they had an eye for someone who no one had heard of, but was someone who produced something to look at that helped them uh, and, and inspired them. And I think now there's a kind of a solipsism and a narcissism, so that really it's about your own world. Mm. And uh, we're in a kind of, you know, Krakauer warned that photography would put us in the eternal present and that we'd just be kind of only living in today. And there's a way in which art has become that as well. And students think they're doing really, you know, remarkable historical research when they work on, you know, 1980. And I, you know, I I end up sounding like a crank and an old fashioned person and which, you know, is not my goal in life. Uh, My goal in life is to say that there is really a lot out there before the time you were born uh, and that, you know, to know it will enrich our own practices. So I also think the art press is so much, you know, about itself and uh, about contemporary uh, art and the world that we live in instead of thinking about the richness of um, art's long history, which is why, you know, it's really interesting because in LA right now there's, I mean, there is a Ken Price show, but Caravaggio is coming to LACMA. Mm. And of course the Getty uh, has a Messerschmitt show. The Getty always has a very important historical shows. Mm. And I think that is, fundamental not only in educating the broad public on kind of all the art that ever has been, but also in developing a kind of artistic sensibility and artistic practice that comes from also looking at, you know, art over time and from different cultures and and different places. So I hope that we see more of that because that's one of the, Mm. I would say, the biggest problems. Um, And that there is also a lack of, as we've gone more global, There's this sense that, you know, every art that's ever been made needs to be accounted for and somehow it all fits into how art's Mm. history developed. And I think that there are productive channels that really did develop in a tradition. I believe Mm. that there are traditions and those traditions did exclude certain things. Mm. And I think we need to teach the history of those traditions and those canons to show what they excluded, to show their blind spots, and then we can also teach some of the stuff that isn't in there and that are, can help us think about forming new canons, mm. uh, whether it's print culture, whether it's posters. But I think I wouldn't favor just doing posters and like forgetting about Kaibat, you know, mm. or forgetting about realism, you know, Courbet. I mean, the idea that there are young people who don't know who Courbet is mm you know, I think is a kind of a loss. It's a cultural loss. And I think as we move on, of course, things always fall in and out. But I think we have to struggle to continue to have a sense of development over time. And Mm. I think that is inspiring and enlightening. And I think the art press could do a lot more on trying to also educate uh, the contemporary art world on the whole history of art because it's very interested in itself and of course it's a creature of the market. I mean it's really, Mm. you know, all those reviews and all that stuff is really at the end of the day a kind of a um, auxiliary discourse to selling and buying art and that's just the truth. Which is a depressing truth really, isn't it for us? You know, well it's a kind of you know, I think it's kind of interesting because I, what I would say is, well, let's admit it and then like let fashion in yeah. too. Because what I don't buy is this kind of you know sacred world, which is really about commerce. Yeah. Then the people who are more obviously honest about commerce, yeah. you know, don't get to be a part of it. So to me, these guys are the hypocrites. I'm like, yeah. so let I'm not worried about Murakami and Louis Vuitton. Yeah. I'm like, fine, that's great. You know, I see it all connected. I've been very interested in fashion and in the aesthetics of fashion. Um, These are definitely artists uh, today and they are also interested, they have taste, 
They um, are definitely working in, in multiple planes because there's a kind of high-end practice of uh, couture, but then there's kind of ready-to-wear, which is more on a you know mass scale, and then there's the accessories, which are really mass scale. And I think people like Valentino and people like Yves Saint Laurent belong in these magazines too. And this is what I've, and I find them much more interesting than half the video artists and the, you know, conceptual artists that end up in, uh, in the art press. So I think we need to, again, open up uh, our categories so that there's more about the people who design the iPod. There's more about the people who design your Nespresso coffee machine. Because we are buying those things because of how they look, too. The only difference there is that because there are so many of them, they're not that valuable. I agree. So compared to, you know, a Mondrian, but compared to a young artist, nobody knows whether their stuff's that valuable. A lot of people buy a lot of art that, you know, ends up being absolutely worth nothing. Mm. Um, just they like it. So how different is that from putting up a, you know, a poster or not buying a coffee machine that you like mm. and having it in your kitchen? To me, it's kind of the same thing. But that's very, it's not, you know, what most people think. I'm, I'm reading a book at the moment called the, ten, uh, so the $12 million Shark that's been getting me thinking about. Got Damien Hirst? Yes, yeah, absolutely. In, uh, well, he's right. I mean, the problem with him is mm. he's very unsubtle, and he's a finger wagger. Mm. You know, instead of he has no sense of humor, <laughs> I think, and he thinks yeah. he has sense of humor because all he has is irony. Yes, yeah. But he's actually not funny, and he's kind of snotty because you know I like Jeff Koons better. It's like yeah. make your balloons and let's put them in Versailles, and you know now they're worth even more. To me, I kind of get that yeah. because. You know, Versailles is a certain way. The balloons kind of also have a certain kind of aesthetic of pleasure to yeah. them. Damien Hirst's problem to me is that he he's pointing a finger at all of us yeah. and then turning around and taking everybody's money. Yeah. Do you think that because the, there is a there is a, a criticality in it comes in yes. his work, isn't there? Absolutely. Um, but I mean, it, you know, the, the theme of death yes. throughout his work is it's very kind of obvious, and I. I I think my cynicism, cynicism about Damien Hirst is that that's his alibi for making the grand gestures they can then kind of market. You know, well, and, and if he well, and if he gave the money, you know, if he really was so critical about the market and the yeah. money, then he should give the money away. Yeah. Then he yeah. shouldn't take it. You yeah. know, and that to me is the kind of ultimate. Uh, I mean, it's brilliant. Mm. It's kind of, but also, you know, there's only one per the person who did this and did it best and most originally is Andy Warhol. Mm. And there was an interesting review of the Warhol show that's at the Met um, just up this week. And, you know, what the show said, it was about Warhol and then kind of people after Warhol. Mm. And what the show kind of, uh, the review concluded, which I think is true, is that the person who st still did this best is Warhol. Mm. Nobody has figured this out and did it as kind of cleverly, as um, sensitively, mm. and as thoughtfully as Warhol. And ever since, artists have been doing it. That's what they do. Cindy mm. Sherman, you know, all of them. Damien Hirst, they're all essentially like writing right out of, you know, Andy Warhol's notebook. Yeah. And so uh, sometimes, I hate to say it because it does kind of elevate the great genius, but I do think that in a way, ever since it's thought, to me there are two, yeah. There's Walt Disney and Andy Warhol. Yeah. And since the two of them, there's nothing really that anyone's done that I think has been really that different or original. Yeah. And I think, you know, they share much more than we like to think. Um, but that's, so Warhol did this that Hearst is yeah. redoing. Yeah. You know, but he did it, I think, in a, more, in a warmer way because I think he liked people better. Even yeah. though he himself was an odd guy socially, he was fascinated with people and there's yeah. a kind of generosity in Warhol you know and a kind of the fan in yeah. Warhol um, the outsider that appreciates what other people have which many people don't have anymore where do you think someone like Banksy fits into the whole thing I mean do you think that he's a brand because he's this anonymous uh, you know I, I, I'm well I'm very you know there's, I think, there's, there's all that kind of the whole street art yeah kind of stuff is you know is interesting yeah um, and I think uh, it's clever it's again it's mm. a clever it's it's like the Marilyn's or whatever it's mm. a conceit I think it's an effective one I think it's a clever one um, I would say that having gone on a long tour of street art in London in the East End of London two summers ago where of course I saw Banksy's pink car I think it is you know is that what it is is it a car yeah right um, anyway in, in uh, there's a few things behind yeah, space yeah exactly <laughs> and they're now you know yeah. kind of no longer now they have to be 
and people are protected. Have tagged the perspex, exactly, so. <laughs> exactly. So I, you know, there's a kind of I think it's interesting. Mm. I think that um, street decoration is an interesting question. Mm. I think that that's really about um, back to Paris and Kaibot. Yeah, yeah. It's about kind of um, social control, mm. and I think um, that there is a little too much tagging because mm. at the end of the day, I actually don't favor um, the trespass of property. Yeah. And yeah. I think, you know, I've always felt it's, um, it's kind of like, you know how robbers and burglars are mostly men? Yeah. So are taggers. And these are people who are very comfortable, like, going into other people's spaces, essentially. Yeah. And so it Which has is what it's about, it's about asserting your presence on somebody else's. Yes. Yeah. And I kind of find it a little, um, you know, aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and kind of childish mm. at the end of the day, and it's no surprise that so many teenagers tag. Do you think the um, the stenciling kind of thing is a is a different? Is that as, you know is that doing the same thing? Or? Well, there's not only stenciling. I saw kind of ceramic, uh, almost emblems put yeah. on on the streets, and to me, that was a little more pleasing because it wasn't as um, it didn't feel yeah. like it was xing something out. It yeah. really felt like it was adorning. There's a guy called Space Invader who yeah. does little tiles around Paris that you see quite. Oh, a lot. I've seen it. Yeah, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And that's and and I saw quite unintrusive, really, in, in a way. Well, and quite that's neat. right. And I yeah. think the kind of so to me there is a difference between what is decorative, you know, mm. and what is um, what is a kind of a pissing on your post. Yeah. And yeah. so I kind of find the uses of open spaces that we decorate somewhat interesting. Yeah. But I also think yeah, there has to be a limit because, you know, it's not your public, it's everybody's public. Yeah. So who decides is always the issue. And that's what kind of city arts people are supposed to kind of try to negotiate and manage. Yeah. I do like the, I like the unexpectedness of art when I see art. I mean, I love coming to someone like the Getty and, you know, seeing the collection, but I like the unexpectedness of some things. And, you know, when I see um, on YouTube things like uh, flash mobs and right. things like that, I, I, for me, I find that really much more excited than, than much art that I find in galleries. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on... The problem with that is the ephemerality, of yeah. course, mm. uh, of all of that. And I think, you know, it's fine for today, but it's not going to mm. last, except maybe on the YouTube. The documentation, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and it was interesting because I saw the Land Art Show mm. uh, at MoCA, which was a very well-done show and well-curated show. But at the end of the day, I thought, well, this is doesn't really make much of a museum show because it's not how land art worked. Mm. You know, it's better to like go to the spiral jetty than to see a movie about it. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think that's, so there are times and places when, you know, real objects matter um, and mm. kind of have more of a long-term impact. But I think we need all kinds of uh, cultural expression mm. that also has different temporalities. Yeah. Some are short-term and some are for eternity. Yeah. And I think having both is, is what's good. Yeah. But And that's why I also wouldn't, um, I think we need to preserve and make sure that we have a trace of all kinds of art mm. that's made, not just the obvious sculptures made for eternity. Yeah. And that's why I do think it's interesting to, to document. We need to document yeah. these flash mobs, definitely. Um, one last question. Yeah. Uh, you're a historian as well as an art historian. How important is political uh, and global history in the understanding of art history? Well, I mean, I, th you know, that to me, art history is history. And this is the thing that I always say to my colleagues, for whom mostly the history of the state or the history of economics or the history of work, kind of those are all legitimate topics for historians. And then art history is like its own little, you know, department um, because uh, they don't see it as really history, as simply a reflection of the real things like the social revolution and whatever. But of course, all forms have histories. Uh, what historians do is study change over time. So anything that changes, as far as I'm concerned, is history, mm -hmm. including art. So the part of art history that I find not to be related to what history is, is essentially aesthetics, you know, a kind of philosophy of uh, taste and uh, a philosophy of uh, aesthetic experience. I think that's a domain that is um, theoretical or philosophical and therefore not historical. It, it, it's not about a time and a place, it's really, they see it as a universal. 
So what's interesting about art history is that within the discipline, it's not entirely historical. There are the kind of formalists who think that kind of form also, uh, instead of looking at it specifically in time and place, they want to see it as a universal tale. There are the estheticians who see universal stories. But then I would say the vast majority now of the field are simply historians. And they work on either the history of the form or the social history of art and its institutions. And obviously those people are the closest to people in history uh, departments. But I think the most important thing that I've tried to do is say, well, I am a historian and what I study is the history of visual culture. Mm -hmm. And that to me is belongs as much in a history department as in an art history department. Mm -hmm. And I think these kind of distinctions are fundamentally um, Un, un, unuseful, except that <coughs> if art history insists that all it's going to study is the history of a canon and the history mm. of taste, then obviously it's incompatible with kind of regular history because the thing about historians is even though there was a tradition of studying elites, that went out a long time mm. ago. And yeah. historians really think like all experience is history. So the equivalent in art history has to be that all images and all yeah. aesthetic experience and all visual culture has to be a part of the history of art for it to kind of share with history mm. a kind of a, an attempt to, in a sense, capture past experience. Mm. So I think that they're very allied and I've never been interested in nations and their histories. Mm. Uh, so when I talk about being interested in modernity, I locate a lot of my research in France, but I don't think of it as a function of the Second Empire or the mm. Third Republic. or that's not. I don't see culture as a reflection of politics. Mm. If I had to kind of say, I do think that economic systems and technological possibilities mm. are the two domains that I think really drive all of history and yeah. nations and politics and paintings are all kind of a function of yeah economics and of technology. So if I had to boil it down, I would yeah. say those are my most important um, driving forces in history. And I think those are equally important for high art as for, you know, mundane vernacular visual culture. Yeah, I see a kind of a, um, a schism uh, between sort of the, the 80s aesthetic that was predominant throughout the 1980s. Uh, and then at the end of the 80s, of course, we had the fall of the Berlin Wall, we had the 87 stock market crash, uh, the NEA debate, um, all of those things, and then a very, very different aesthetic into the 1990s where it becomes much more kind of bodily, um, a move away from that kind of very much more text-based art that was mm -hmm. predominant throughout the 1980s. Well, I think you're right, and the question is again, uh, you know, well, what's that about? It can certainly mm. be seen as a response to a kind of intellectualism and of conceptual art, mm. But it could also be a um, an unwitting understanding of commercial culture, which has always been. It never needed to change. Mm. Mass culture and commercial culture has always been bodily. It has always been multisensory. Mm. And I think that art doesn't know it, but I think it's actually very influenced by this. And I think one of the, I've been very interested in dance mm. and in um, actually ballet, kind of classical. Yeah. dance, which is also a deeply um, ordered mm. experience. It has rules, it has all this, but it's very multisensory. It is the Gesamtkunstwerk. I mean, mm. that ballet and opera, you know, these great 18th, 19th century forms, and ballet goes back much further, you know, really are sensory. And, yeah. you know, it would, it's a pity because most of the contemporary artists working in kind of body art don't know a thing about it. Mm. And it would yeah. do them very, they would learn a lot. Yeah if they, you know, went to, to some ballet. Uh, and I think it would actually um, make their work richer um, because it would also bring out the logic, I think, you know, and pattern and things mm. that I think have for all time had meaning in aesthetic production. And that again, people like Walt Disney, you know, people think is a fascist in some ways, mm -hmm. but he also understood pattern. Mm. He understood uh, wayfinding, you know, he understood order and logic, mm. which actually people need when they experience something aesthetic. Mm. Uh, it's a, it is a canalization of the senses. That's what art really is. It's yeah. a, an address to the senses, and it's an organization of sensory experience. And yeah. so to really understand people who are really masters of organizing it and having some structure, I think, would be very illuminating for a lot of contemporary practice. So that's why I like to teach classical stuff, not just because, say, it's my taste, but because I think mm. 
they, they give us great insight into how we could produce different kinds of uh, not necessarily, obviously it's not classical, of kind of what we would call can our contemporary art could be enriched with more knowledge about things that are very different from our own world. Vanessa, thank you very okay, much for the interview. It was you're welcome. very interesting and see you again.